session, we will have four presentations. The first one for from Ra, Ra, sorry for, for, for the accent Ron Esteban, who is currently a PhD student in uh, at the University of Lausanne, and you will present to us uh, a paper about uh, the different the, the exploration. He, he made about different policy and um, uh, the effect on the impact uh, uh, on climate change. Uh, the second one will be Dr. Koji Tokimatsu from uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology, who will present to us his, pro his proposal to integrate uh, a life cycle impact assessment model uh, in the integrated assessment model uh, in order to, to, to show us uh, how energy mix structure uh, can have various impact on different uh, um, parameters. Uh, the third one will be Dr. Uh, Novasia from the um, Lithuanian Energy Institute. Uh, and he will present to us his uh, analysis of a few hypothetical scenario of Lithuanian power sector development with high share of renewables. And the fourth one will be uh, Xiaoming Khan, who is currently a PhD student uh, uh, at the Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden, and um, he will present uh, us a comprehensive analysis uh, regarding whether or not uh, utilizing uh, uh, electric cooling uh, makes investment in solar PV more cost effective, uh, and he will focus uh, his analysis uh, uh, his analysis on seven regions. So. Please, uh, Juan Esteban, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Good morning to everyone. Um, thank you for this invitation for this conference. Um, I would like to ask, is 20 minutes of speech, right? Yeah, no okay, more so than 20 minutes. Okay, so I will uh, share my screen. Okay. To everyone. Can you see the slides right now? Uh, can, can you see my screen right now? Not at the moment. Yet. I think you started, but we cannot see yet. You can play the, you can try to play it. Uh, your screen is paused. Uh, right now you can see it? Yeah, yeah, we can see it now. Good. Okay. So I will start right now. Thank you very much. So good morning to everyone. My name is Juan Esteban Martinez Jaramillo. I'm a student of business analytics in the University of Lausanne, the department of HSC. I'm going to present to you part of my research that uh, is named Facing Climate Change, the Switzerland have uh, enough water. So the problem statement will talks or try to, to address the relationship that is between climate change, the electricity system and natural resources. As we all know, climate change is an issue that is being on the main side of governments and researchers. So to mitigate the effects of climate change, governments around the world have targeted a lot of economical sectors, but I will focus more on the electricity system. So the governments have been incentivizing green generation. Our problem here is that when you take into account uh, the different electricity systems transitioning towards um, green uh, generation, well, we're putting a lot of pressure on natural resources because well, green generation will use uh, sun, wind or water. And with climate change, we will not know exactly how are going to be these resources on the future. So in fact, if the electricity systems are transitioning towards this low carbon generation, they will rely more and more in resources that have a lot of variability. So generation will not be guaranteed due to the nature of these resources. So blackouts could occur on the future. Also, another, another problem that uh, happens when the electricity systems are transitioning towards low carbon generation is that currently they are costly. They also reduces the security of supply due to the nature of, of natural resources. It reduces the flexibility of the electricity system 
And when we talk about climate change, it's a long-term approach. So many things can happen in the future. So it's difficult to planify what is going to happen. So again, climate change has a, a dual relationship between supply and demand. So when, well, when we're talking about climate change, we, well, we will try to, to produce more with renewables. So the, the, the supply will rely on renewables. So there will be an uncertainty on supply that will increase uh, if we introduce more and more uh, renewables. As well as consumers, there has been a movement to transition towards elect electric cars that will increase demand. So it will put more pressure on the electricity system. And also climate change can change patterns in demand and generation. In demand, due to uh, changes in, in temperature, so we could increase in some countries the consumption of electricity for air conditioning during summer. And also on the other side, in winter, if there are hotter winters, we will need less electricity to heat the uh, spaces. In the part of the supply, well, as resources Will, uh, will have variability. We will not know if there will be enough water in the country that use hydropower as a main uh, supply. So also creates this uncertainty. So our research goal is to manage a transition of the electricity system with an increase in demand and a reduction in natural resources to achieve this, we want to explore if governmental intervention is required and which of those are the ones that drive the electricity market to a smooth performance. And to do this, we are developing an electricity model for Switzerland that allow us to test different policies. So our approach is to build a stylized simulation model of an electricity system that is being um, applied to a study case that is Switzerland, but that this model could be extrapolated to other regions or other countries. This model has an early approach using a typical day per month. Uh, this means that we are uh, putting as inputs the demand and supply of each hour of a typical day per month. We are uh, taking into account as well three climate scenarios that we use the representative concentration pathways, RCP 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5 to, to estimate the change in temperature. And with this uh, change in temperature, we can estimate as well the evolution in patterns of demand and supply that is going to happen on the next years. Our time horizon is 80 years. So the model starts from 2020 and ends in 2100. One consideration that we took into account in this model is that it doesn't take no imports, no exports. And this decision is due to analyze if a country such as Switzerland is able to achieve the transition that in instance, uh, I want to talk about with you is this country is trying to phase out the nuclear uh, capacity. Uh, due to the accident that happens in Fukushima in 2011. And the question is, what is going to do to replace this? So one of the ideas is to transition from nuclear to photovoltaics and pump hydro storage. So the question is, if Switzerland can be self-sufficient, uh, having this mix of technologies. And another reason why we didn't take into account imports nor exports is because all the European countries are also transitioning towards renewables. So it's possible that the peak of generation of all the countries in the Eurozone is going to be more or less at the same time if they rely all in solar. And also that at the same time will be a lack of electricity, for example, at nights, and it will be uh, blackouts around all the continent. So, and the figure that you are seeing on the slide is like the, the main variables that I'm taking into account. This is a mix between a causal loop and a, a stock and flow diagram.
that are used in the methodology that I'm using that is named system dynamics. Um, here, I'm showing you the state variables of my model, the main state variables. By one hand, there is a renewable technology that in my case is PV and a storage technology that in my case is pump hydro storage. As I said before, this model can be extrapolated to other regions. So PV could be replaced by other renewables, um, for instance, wind or geothermal or other uh, renewable technology. And PHS could be replaced by other storage such as hydrogen or batteries. So here I'm showing more or less a relationship between the, the, um, the main variables how the renewable generation occurs, how the excess of electricity is used to store, how the PV uh, or the renewable profitability is uh, calculated, and also for the storage um, profitability cal calculated, and with that, how are the investments done? So with this model, we can ask the next question that is, uh, will the system be reliable under climate change conditions? So to test this, we run the model with the three climate scenarios that are the three RCPs, RCP 2.6, RCP 4.5, and RCP 8.5. And as we see on the graph, the model shows that after 2024, that is the first uh, decommission of the first nuclear plant in Switzerland, there are going to be unmet demand until the end of the simulation. This means that there will be blackouts all the year, all, uh, all the years after 2024. So the system is unable to meet demand and supply. Um, market driven investments in this case are not enough. So if we let that the system only relies on the performance of the market, there will not be enough investments to cover the, the demand of the system and also, um, well, with these uh, results, then we saw that it doesn't matter which type of climate change scenario we are using will not be enough. So for further analysis, we decided to take the scenario RCP 4.5 to test different uh, uh, policies. We use it because this is in the middle of the three. So it's the one that will represent like uh, different type of, of, of out, outputs of the model. So given the climate change uncertainties, how can we plan the future? So afterwards, we start testing some policies. The first one that we decided to test is a demand side management. In this case, the government will focus on the electric car uh, owners so as we said before, I said before, the, 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 the consumers will start transitioning towards aggressively towards uh, electric cars due to, well, publicity or, or the feeling that we can do something to mitigate the climate change impacts. So more and more people will have uh, electric cars and this will increase the electricity demand in uh, some hours of the day. So the, the first policy will try to focus on, on this sector and the government will incentivize owners to recharge their cars at times for their excess generation. This means when there's an increase or excuse me, when the renewable generation is high enough or when the, the demand is lower than the generation. In this case, only changing this particular sector of the economy, we can see that the unmet demand decreases comparing with the case where, well, the, the owners can charge their car at any time they want. Although it's not enough, we see that there's still unmet demand, but there is a reduction of 16% six, of the unmet demand by 2100. Next, as we see, well, demand side management was not enough. So we introduced one uh, type of subsidy. In this case, we are uh, testing capacity auctions. 
uh, capacity auctions is where the regulator defines the capacity or the generation that must be available at a certain moment in time. And under this mechanism, companies submit a bid with a price that in fact is like the required subsidy per unit of capacity or per unit of generation at which they are willing to install new capacity. So in this figure, I'm showing you how is uh, put the, how we put this on the model. So after calculating the renewable capacity and what is under construction, we can know the share of generation forecast of this technology and with the other uh, technologies, in this case, hydropower, uh, we can calculate an energy margin and the energy margin gap. The energy margin gap represents in this case, the deficit of energy required to satisfy the annual forecast electricity demand. The energy margin gap in this case calculates all the energy that is available to generate electricity in a certain moment of time. And it subtracts the demand and divided by the demand as well. So if it's positive, it means that in that moment of, of the year or in that hour, there is enough energy to cover the, the demand and if it's negative, it is sending a signal to the um, regulator that there is a required of energy to satisfy the demand. So this signal will tell the regulator that there's a need to give a subsidy, a subsidies, to give subsidies to invest in new capacity. So our model, uh, the subsidies are based on, on this variable that is the energy demand. After we run the model with this uh, subsidy, we can see the following results. So at the right, we see the electricity price. The gray line shows the case where there are no subsidies and the black one is with subsidies. So we see the difference between the, the two price of the, the electricity price under the subsidies is lower. And also this has an impact on the investments. So to understand a little bit, this model starts with, uh, well, the, the first one that uh, gives the electricity to the market are the, the renewables. And the last one is hydropower. Uh, and in hydropower, the last one is the one that comes from the storage technology that in this case is pump hydro storage. So if the last one is hydro uh, storage, um, the electricity price when it's high is giving an incentive to hydro storage to continue in, uh, investing because the prices are always high. As we see in the gray, gray line, after 2050, the price more or less is, is constant. It's around uh, between 300 uh, francs per megawatt hour uh, and 350. So if we see in the other graph that it is installed capacity, the dotted line shows that the PHS or pump hydro storage increased more or less linearly from 2038 until 2076. And this is due because PHS benefits from this scarcity price that occurs when there are blackouts. Uh, meanwhile, if you see the black, uh, well, in my screen should be dotted, but I think it's showing it. Uh, straight but is the one that is more or less concave that is in black pv doesn't increase the same way and this is because pv doesn't benefit from these high prices because it's the first that delivers and if in the other two k in the other two install capacities the that has some oscillations the black one is pv and the gray one uh, that is also kind of concave, but with a little bit of oscillations is PHS. These two increases because, well, the first one PV increases fast at the beginning due to subsidies. And when there's more PV, uh, there will be more excess electricity, which allows PHS to benefit from this excess of generation because it increase the utilization rate of, of, of their pumps. Do, and also at the end will increase increasing the benefits. So also if we encourage PV, that in this case, the subsidy is only for PV, PHS will also benefit and increase the investments on, on PHS. So finally, uh, the conclusions for 
for this research is that we built a base case where we asked the question, if profit-driven investments are insufficient, then we introduce two different policies, one with capacity, one that is called capacity options, and the other one, demand side management. And we found that without any interventions, the market will face blackouts. Then as we introduced demand side management, we saw that it reduces the unmet demand, but it's not enough for the system that because it will continue being unmet demand. And after we introduced capacity auctions, we saw that it's, it is possible to eliminate blackouts. And this specific subsidy only for PV, we saw that it increased the PV. And when it increased the PV, there's more excess generation. And with this excess of generation, PHS uh, has a higher utilization rate. And at the end, well, it will increase as well the PHS installed capacity. So as a conclusion of that, subsidizing PV indirectly encourages uh, PHS as well. So that's uh, the things that I, I have been working out, out with my my tutor and well my two tutors and uh, thank you very much for your time if you have questions or feedback there's my mail and also i would like well i would be glad to answer your questions right now okay thank you ron maybe we can have question now or we can organize a round of question for all the presentation after the Fourth one, what do you prefer? For me, it's okay if it's now or later. Okay, do you have some question? Not one, one? I have questions, no. <laughs> you have questions about my work, I will be glad to answer them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh Okay. Uh, this is just like the session host. I just want to ask uh, Juan if it's possible to, when, in the end, of course, to share the uh, the documents to upload them to the dashboard, the <coughs> the, the presentation. Uh, I, I uploaded these uh, slides. Oh, okay, to the if dashboard. it's uploaded, it's fine. It's just a, a reminder. No worries. Yeah, I received the mail that says like uh, you have until that day to upload your slides, and I uploaded. Yeah, the same way. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, maybe one question. Um, why uh, do you put focus on uh, pump hydro storage uh, as a mean uh, to, to, to storage uh, PV solar? Do you have uh, other technologies that could be incentivized uh, through PV subsidies? Yeah, as uh, I said, it's a stylized model, but we calibrated for Switzerland. So we had to take into account the potential of Switzerland for different technologies. Um, well, because of the time, also my fault that I didn't uh, talk more about the background of Switzerland. The, the current mix of technologies in this country is um, the generation comes more or less 60% from hydro, well, the, the traditional hydro storage, and the other part is uh, nuclear generation and a little bit of solar and, and biomass. So the geographical conditions of Switzerland, Switzerland allow uh, or makes that pump hydro storage is the, the technology with the higher potential. Mm -hmm. But as I said, it could be replaced by other technology that shows a better performance such as hydrogen or um, batteries but it's, it's because of uh, hydrological and geographical conditions. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have one question as well. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, so um, you did not include the transmission trade between other countries. So how would you say if you have, or if you allow electricity trade between let's say Italy and Switzerland, how would that affect your results? That's a good question. The thing is that, um actually well switzerland trades a lot with their neighbors so neighbors of switzerland are germany italy austria france and uh, well Liechtenstein, and uh, well like five countries so now nowadays switzerland uh, imports nuclear electricity from france and also from germany but 
in, for instance, Germany is also decommissioning their nuclear generation and they are focusing a lot in wind and, 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 and PV. Uh, France, uh, currently, they, are not, they don't have any plans to decommission their nuclear plants. And for Italy, it's more the other side. Switzerland makes the, the, the following business. It buys cheap electricity from France, the nuclear electricity, and at the peak times where Italy needs electricity, they sell uh, hydro generation to Italy. So it's, it's a business model. But if we're talking about uh, climate change and the European countries, because all the packs, the, the uh, the, the green uh, agreements, they are transitioning all to the same uh, type of technology or similar type uh, of technology that is wind and solar. Juan? Yes. Hello? Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, what so, happened? Uh, we can hear you, but like, the picture is frozen. Yeah, it's been frozen. Now it's okay. OK, so if all the countries are transitioning to the same uh, type of technology or similar, like winter and solar, well, they will have the same problem at the same time. Uh, excess uh, generation and lack of generation at the same time. So the idea, some countries talk about, like, there's a study in Germany that says, OK, Switzerland should be the battery of Europe because they have a lot of uh, hydro storage uh, plants. But it's not really liable that every country says, OK, I will uh, hope that then our, uh, our border country will save us when we don't have electricity. So that's why we focus on self-sufficiency first and further research. OK, we're going to introduce the problem that all the countries have the same issue at the same time. But for instance, no, we focus on only in that. Thanks. OK. Thank you. Maybe now we can hear Dr. Tokimatsu. Hello. Hello. Is it my time to, to present? Yeah, yeah. Okay, just, just a moment. You're welcome. We hear you, doctor. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, th thanks. Yeah, just a moment. I, will, I can start soon, just a moment. Just a moment. Okay, um, can you see my slide? Yeah, we see your slides. Thanks. So, um, thank you very much for joining today's present uh, today's session. Uh, my name is Koji from Tokyo Tech, Tokyo Institute of Technology from Japan. And my topic is about the uh, integrated assessment modeling framework, but a not un unconventional way for more focus on about the uh, damage functions. So, um, <clears throat> Here is the introduction about the integrated assessment modeling frameworks. Uh, that mostly that there are two types or main streams of IAM approaches. So one is process-based on uh, disaggregated, uh, more better to say, systems engineering uh, with detailed bottom-up technologies. The other one is a climate welfare economy uh, for compare costs and benefits under different climate policies. Here is an illustration about the two types of IAMs. Uh, the process-based, it's uh, coming from the resource input that is converted by the technology to generate uh, for emissions and the resources input to, to the world economy. And then the greenhouse gas emission go to the carbon cycle and radiative forcing and climate. climate. I mean, for example, temperature rise or sea level rise, whatever. And um, they are also giving the, um, <clears throat> writing the impact by the climate change. 
but the process-based uh, digital system engineering do not feed back mostly back to the world economy. While the climate welfare economy, that you know that the economy, economy and the carbon cycle and climate and damage is feedback to the world economy. And the most, most of the uh, framework is a uh, uh, maximization of the social welfare that is <clears throat> sourced from the consumption. And the, here is a, a damage function that is better to say a uh, temperature uh, damage relationship. So here is, for example, a uh, climate vari variables like a, a global temperature rise or sea level rise and the economic impact, impacts is generated by using this damage function. And the damage function is typically right, right as, as such that here is a damage and that it is an uh, output or better to say a GDP level. And uh, capital T is a global temperature, right? And um, there is typically um, quadratic uh, function and or something the um, um, catastrophic impact like that one. And there is um, in general form, there is also the income elasticity. So the mostly uh, the income elasticity is um, zero. That means that it's a multiply to the, dam to the damages. And um, this, damage function generate the percentage of GDP loss directly by one step. By one step, I mean that the, this damage expressed by the percent of GDP loss is expressed by the temperature rise. And um, there are a lot of the argument about what better to say dispute about this um, damage function. Why needs, for example, uh, this is particular algebraic formula that in, in, especially in the parameter settings, like um, alpha and also the other, what, what kind of the fun, functional form is, is applied. So the other way is actually, um, sometimes it is called as a willing to pay, but it is also uh, determined by the model of choice. So uh, there are many uh, works try to overcome this um, shortcomings of the damage functions. Uh, one is, for example, Howard Stoner in 2017 that they tried to, uh, to survey uh, various um, enumerative, um, in data say, to say, uh, integrated assessment modeling framework for the what kind of damage functions they applied and uh, tried to eliminate the biases and statistic uh, approaches. And, but still, uh, such kind of approach is a, a weak as a found, a foundation of natural science and engineering and still black boxiness. So um, here, what I set up the research question is uh, without using this such kind of the, uh, the aggregated damage function by how we can in, in develop an IAM uh, with uh, um, integrating uh, comprising damage assessment grounded in science, engineering and economics. Why including the resource use and the, uh, and the environmental impact in addition to global warming? So our proposal is to employ the life cycle impact assessment for a framework. LCIA is, is a variation of life cycle impact assessment. So it's a one step of the LCA, but this is not a bit different from the conventional uh, inventory analysis. It's a cradle free framework, which is well, frame, well, well known, but the impact assessment framework is try to to monetize the, um, the, the the damage that causes by the, for example, climate change. So here is a part here again that most of the um, um, damage function, as I show that, is a temperature rise, civil rise is just input to the black box damage function and it generated percent of, percentage of loss, GDP loss, for example. But our approach is different way that first we apply the impact pathway framework that is mostly based on the science and engineering modeling frameworks. Or sometimes it went on heavily depend on the on literature coming from these <clears throat> specific or complex and detailed 
engineering models, uh, science and engineering models. And this impact pathway framework generates in physical impact. And then step forward to the survey and road survey and, uh, and make um, conjoint analysis to make economic valuation of the physical impact to generate uh, millions of units to pay. That is half a unit in US dollar. US dollar. That means that um, impact was paid here that explicitly cause, uh, uh, analyze the causes and the physical impact. The physical impact means the non monetary term impact, like, uh, for example, dairy in one for, for, for a year, for example. And dairy is a huge impact um, unit, uh, unit. And they, uh, the model is mostly the detailed uh, process based <clears throat> models. While the economic variation part, that uh, we, we convert the physical impact like uh, dairy to the monetary, uh, monetary term by using the state preference uh, so survey and conjoint analysis. It um, maybe European people sometimes know that about the um, external e study that is mostly focused on the um, energy technology assessment for the external cost of the generating electricity. That is uh, the four steps. Uh, sources of the of, of the emissions from the for example typical uh, gener generating electricity like a coal and the coal uh, for example greenhouse gas or SOx and NOx is um, dispersed and increases the concentration at this particular size and then we step forward to the uh, concept about the, those response function to generate impact that means that those and responding function means that if we increase the if the concentration of the for example socks, then the, our the human uh, impact is increased. That is a uh, more ep epidemic of uh, uh, relations. And then finally, monetary convert to monetary term that is coming from the environmental economics part. So similar to uh, external e studies, but actually our for the LCI model frame is different from the external e studies. And um, here is the other um, um, approach that meta to say about the what is the difference or what is what we what we can distinguish from the other standard approaches. Uh, the standard approach, so mostly the um, <clears throat> economic variation is sourced from the literatures, and especially from the benchmark damage is like uh, 2.5 for three degrees Celsius rise. How much? the um, economic impact is given specific time and specific vision. And recently, the um, more um, degression analysis to analyze the comp uh, relations between the economic growth versus or economic uh, level versus um, um, weather or climate uh, factors, whether it's a more shorter term and the climate is a more longer term um, <clears throat> And the, by using some more um, rigorous um, degradation analysis, they distinguish between the shorter effects and longer term effects. Like um, that is, uh, such kind of publication is coming from the, these kind of the uh, literatures here. And recently, the expert citation is much more a bit um, sample size a bit larger. Uh, in the beginning, uh, Northern House and Boiser. They, they start just using the sample size only 20 on uh, export about that. But uh, how are silver and pin like recently? It's much more a uh, large uh, ex, ex, um, export extension to estimate the damage functions. And also on Saturday as well, uh, they all try to use the data framework to, to assess the percentage GDP loss by the coming from the um, or non physical uh, phys physical impact to the uh, GDP loss. And ours is much more uh, totally different from the uh, standard approach that we survey uh, more than 7,000 samples to general public in 30 cities from the 25 countries. That means uh, coming from the G20 countries and Asian countries. And I mean, whatever we used to pay. Uh, it's a derived from a conjoint analysis that is 
well, so recently, well matured technique and in environmental and resource economic field. So this is one thing that we uh, that can distinguish uh, us from the others. And the other one is the consistency. Uh, the standard um, that modern framework, they are literature are each from the sectoral damage items. And um, that means that there are uh, several uh, sectoral damage, even though in uh, global climate change. But that means that um, there are also potential inconsistencies among the uh, assessment, damage assessment, like uh, technique or target samples, et cetera, et cetera. And but ours, we set, we predetermined the full set of marginal willing to pay that were generated by generated simultaneously and consistently from the uniform questionnaire seats. That means that our questionnaire seats, it's um, a conjoint set about the questionnaire survey and the tables by four from endpoint. Endpoint is a I have to say, explain what is end points and the payment. Any points is um, something that we would like to go from the impacts like uh, human health or natural resources and biodiversity and um, 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 primary productivity. And finally, it's a body uh, transfer. It's um, Mostly the uh, standard literature is in standard damage assessment coming from the literatures or modern choice. And um, such kind of the literatures uh, coming from, for example, US, uh, uh, West European countries and um, current situation, for example, and then such kind of the damage and, um, and the region must be transferred to the other, re uh, other, other, other locations. And uh, far from from now, it's a remote far from futures. So, but compared to that, uh, our approach we can use income elasticity, and uh, also body transfer function that are derived from the marginal wins to pace. So here is the uh, our interest assessment modeling framework. Uh, here it's a, a standard uh, climate welfare economic IAM. That is the two factor input like a capital and labor. It's a production function and damage function is multiplied to the fun production function. Here is a damage function. And um, this damage function again, that is expressed by the percent of GDP loss, for example. But ours is different. What is we, we disaggregated into more of, of six uh, input, fa input factors for the production functions. And this is the internal cost of supplying resources. And here the, we have an external cost of the, of, of the environment, damage, environment damages. So in, in what we do, what we did is um, here is a conventional uh, standard climate welfare economic damage framework and using the damage function. But ours, the, we separated two passes. One is a, a conventional greenhouse gas emissions for climate change that is also go to the carbon cycle and climate change. And the other one is um, uh, other um, impact other than global warming that is we can we can take we can consider that the local air pollution, acid rain, land use, and resource extraction and waste, and also layer depletions. So, but, but instead of the damage function, we can intake, we can assess the two um, conventional uh, global climate change impact, and the other one is uh, coming from the other uh, impact uh, from the global warming. So here is a environmental external cost, and um, here is a marginal greens to pay that I mentioned that this is um, derived from the um, greens to pay, and here is uh, income elasticity that can be um, derived from the um, uh, survey to the seven, uh, uh, more than seven thousand um, uh, samples. 
And um, here is EP. EP stands for endpoints, damages. And the point again, that the predetermined in our mode life cycle assessment framework, that is uh, human health, uh, natural resources, and biodiversity, and net, net primary productivity. So uh, this and the point damages is expressed by the uh, those response functions and multiplied by the inventories other than global warming case. In the global warming case that is expressed by the temperature rise and the sea level rise and the income changes. And other than, other than the global warming case that is the ACIA model that provide us the um, damage, damage coefficient list and that is coefficient list is much is adjusted to the uh, other regions and other and other time. So um, <clears throat> here we set the scenarios. Uh, we set three uh, climate policy, but uh, in the e EFF case, we have additional three uh, three uh, different um, cases. The first one is a reference. Um, this is as usual. The second one is a uh, EF case that is feedback damage is uh, <clears throat> included, but without any uh, exogenous uh, climate policy uh, that it corresponds to the optimal uh, simulation. And to DC, it's an um, increased feedback and ex exogenous capping of the global mean temperature rise to no more than two Celsius degree over time after the computational of uh, time horizon. In order to compare to the conventional southern one and our others, we set these three different uh, scenarios in the um, EAF case. One is our modeling framework that is coming from that is named LIME, L -I -M -E, uh, fully employing the ACIA model to both global warming and, uh, and the others. Um, this model is uh, uh, developed by the Japanese modelers, including me, and this geographical coverage is almost in all the countries in, the, in this in the latest version. And Excuse me, is, Mr. Koji-san. Uh, I yep. think you have uh, a few minutes left to continue, unless if there's a uh, uh, different... Uh, Organization regarding this meeting. Sorry, I think I think uh, it's already almost twenty minutes. Oh yes, about twenty minutes. Okay. I think yes. Okay, so I, I try to uh, skip uh, skip yes. speed up and try to shorten the key result. Okay? okay, and uh, it's a dice plus run. It's a dice. It's a coming. The global warming damage is coming from the dice, and the other damage is coming from the run. And the third one is the dice only, that is a start and one. And um, that is what I, this is the conventional uh, temperature rise and sea level rise that is in, in, giving to the climate change damages. And we can also um, simulate, uh, calculate the, um, for example, primary energy surprise similar to the more disaggregated uh, bottom-up energy technology <coughs> frameworks. That is, for example, this is at in the 2100s. The, this is a reference. It's um, more um, <coughs> centered about the core or other fossil fuels. And uh, the to DC, most of the uh, carbon captured storage. And uh, there are three patterns of the dice only. And uh, compared to dice only, we have more, more or less uh, excuse me, less um, of fossil fuel con consumptions due to the big impact by the environment. So here is the em environment impact that is expressed by the external costs in the US dollar. So um, here, for example, this maybe most of the, you know that this is dice only, the biggest one. And the dice plus one, we have additional impact by, for example, local air pollution, Land use change impact and resource extractions. And when applied fully um, impact assessment framework, we can also show that, for example, here is a global warming by the land, resource, uh, land resources, and here is a uh, biodiversity uh, impact, here is a human health impact. 
and the, this kind of this um, global warming impact is less than dice only. And we can also show the other impacts as such. So time is limited. So um, here is a summary of my presentation. Thank you very much. And sorry for the <clears throat> running time of, of, my, of my speaking, sorry. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Kimatsu. Is there any question? Um, maybe I have one. Uh, so your analysis um, at a very long term horizon up to 2150. Uh, how do you deal with the question of the rate of discount? Oh, uh, yes, that is. Any, every time we have or suffers at the time we are on this, on this kind of thing issue. In my case, I do not apply, um, it's kind of something like a middle of the, of the discounting between, for example, uh, Stern's case would be closer to 0 0.1. And compared to that, for example, Norther House case, they start, he started from 3.5 and I'm already describing um, discounting. Uh, in my case, um, just set up a two percent of discount rate over the time horizon, and sometimes we make um, sensitive analysis that the parameter changes from 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 the zero to two to zero point one to to four, for example, and given the um, time change variation of the discounting, that is kind of this uh, sensitivity analysis. Okay, thank you. Any other question? So thank you very much, Dr. Tokimatsu. Very interesting. And I think that uh, we can uh, hear now Dr. Novaitsa from okay. Lithuanian Energy Institute. Yeah. OK, we hear you. Fine. OK, can you see my slides? Yes, 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 we are. Yes. Okay, good. So I will start. And then uh, my topic is also about the modeling of, uh, of energy future. And uh, we are also interested, like a first presenter, we are also interested in into the analyzing various scenarios, how to avoid emissions uh, from power generation mainly. And for that, we have a project in which we are developing model. And we are, maybe one difference is that we are concentrating on not only on power sector, but on the whole economy, or economy sectors. And also we, we are, worried about the, the possible power shortage when there is uh, no wind or no sun. So we are the developed special approach how to model renewables in order to avoid such situation that the power system will have shortage of energy in certain periods when there is no renewable power available. So in my presentation, I mean that we'll be focusing on this approach and I will present how we try to model renewables to avoid such situation. So this is a short content of my presentation. I will start from some general challenges which facing modelers when trying to model these uh, decarbonization scenarios. Later on, I will present our model, model, method how to deal with renewables in such a models. And I will discuss some results of the practical application of our method. So, in our approach, we think that the decarbonization of the, the analysis of the decarbonization must be performed in the context of the longer term development of the whole economy. So it means that uh, all sectors like power, transport, industry, 
agriculture must be analyzed simultaneously and not separate. And uh, to be able to objective account the possible greenhouse gas and emission limits or to impose introduce some taxation for these emissions. This is only feasible if all economic sectors are modeled in, suffi in sufficient details. In our modeling, the focus is on technological processes and uh, how to model and how to represent them in, in the model because uh, emission accounting is quite straightforward. And our model is based on the bottom-up modeling approach. It is an optimization model, which are, and this approach is quite uh, common in, this, such, in such modeling. Uh, literature suggests that the renewable sources and the electrification of our sectors will play an essential role in the carbonized economy. So then modeling and analyzing the high shares of renewables in the future, modelers uh, have some challenges how to represent them in the energy models. There is some problems uh, which modelers have to deal with. And, uh, one of the main problems, maybe when modeling renewables, is the, the variability of renewable energy. And this variability must be assessed in the long-term models, and analyzing possible future scenarios. Because uh, it is essential that uh, power systems should have sufficient resources to cover periods when there is no wind or sun available. So flexibility of energy system becomes more important in this aspect. And high shares of renewable power also will require more investments in balancing and uh, probably maybe other flexibility measures that should be in introduced in the energy system. So in this case, when we are modeling to receive correct results, preferably hourly or even higher resolution modeling is required for correct results. And also, we, as I said earlier, we are trying to integrate not only power sector, but uh, transport industry, households, and so on in one model. So at this point, we are facing, that when we are modeling such, uh, such, when we are creating such model, we are facing one big problem because standard long-term energy models usually are insufficient for such type of model. And that is because uh, models becomes too complex and uh, the solving of models requires huge computational and time resources. So one of the possible solutions to this problem could be application of specific modeling approaches. And I will try to present one in, in my presentation. Uh, maybe I'll start from some basic information uh, on modeling renewables. Uh, the temporal aspect is the main problem. In such models, which we are applying for analysis, uh, usually time specific time steps need to be specified, like, like uh, it's a, by default in all models. Usually, the, it is done by dividing each analyzed year into a few seasons. Over on each season is divided into a few types of days, like work days and weekends. And further on, each day is divided into additional time periods for a goal to represent the supply and demand differences between, for example, night and peak consumption. And in the model, each, each of these time periods called time slices, and it uh, represents certain number of hours with different uh, availability of renewables. In my presentation, I, 
I will use wind power as, a, as an example. And for on, I will be talking about wind power, but this approach could be also applied for, for example, solar power and so on. And uh, such di division of time is usually too low to fully address the impacts of variable resources on the results of the model. In this slide, this is an example. Maybe all of you know that wind is very, wind power could be very, could change very drastically within few hours. And this is the example. We take just one time slice in the model and we collected the information about, about wind generation in these time slices, for example, in the evenings of the work days. And we can see from this example that wind. Wind generation is, here is expressed as in, in terms of wind capacity factor to change from zero to almost one in the same time of the day, let's say. So this is the same information for the same time slice, uh, but this time this information provided in the form of duration curve. And in our research, we, we call it this curve wind power probability curve. This is original data from statistics, for example, of wind generation. And as I said, if we are modeling one time slice, we can only provide for, no, for the model when value. This means that from this, we can provide for model when value, which is the average wind capacity factor in certain time slice. And this is provided for the model. If we go through the all time slices for the whole year, for the whole model of year, this is the original information about wind power availability during the year. And if we go with the, the average value, we have such curve which is provided for the model. As you can see, in this way, we are losing information about high wind generation period and also low wind generation period. And this data provided for the model is uh, very far from reality and uh, we can't expect good results from such information. So the average cap wind capacity factors for each time slice is not good approach. And we came up with the methodology how, how to improve such uh, modeling and uh, how to improve the data provided for a model to get better results of uh, renewable generation. And our approach is to, is uh, to improve wind representation in the model by dividing each of the time slice into additional segments. The number of segments can be chosen by the modeler and by the user of the modeler. And in each time slice, these lengths of additional segments could differ depending on wind availability, on wind availability in this time slice. Later on, we approximate this wind power curve by uh, stepwise curves, by such curve. And this curve, now it's provided as input for the model in each of our time slices which we have in the model. So in this way, we provide the model information and what power wind could be generated and for how long in the specific segments of time slice. And as I said, this is the now input for the model. The number of time slices also can be chosen by the by the user. So in case we divide each time slice into five segments, and if we now provide the information for model about wind power in, in whole year, now we can see that this curve is much better represent the real wind power probability from statistics. And uh, this data provided for the model is much better representation of the real stationary reality. So 
Now the model has information about high wind or low wind, uh, periods with high or low wind generation. So uh, we also address few research questions regarding the application of this methodology. And for this, we used uh, the model of Ukrainian power system. And we did some experiments uh, to see, for example, first question, what is the, was, what is the quantitative effect of such wind modeling approach on long-term scenario results? And in this slide, I would like to illustrate this, uh, the impact of our approach. Here is the results provided by model regarding generated power of wind, power plants and other power plants, uh, fossil power plants, for example, could be on gas or some other power plants in case of uh, two different approaches. The uh, figure on the left represents the results with the average wind capacity factor. The figure on the right represents results in some specific time slice with the uh, wind power probability curve, which was approximated by three steps. And here we can compare the results. As you can see, if, it, if you take a look at the at, uh, capacitors, which is the result of modeling results for year 2050, here is uh, the power demand, which is exactly the same in, the, in this in this time slice, but only due to the different uh, modeling approaches of wind power, we have received different results. And here we can see in this uh, in this picture that uh, to ensure adequate power supply when there is no wind, this means this segment of time slice, then model installs additional significant capacities of uh, for example, gas turbines or other flexibility measures to, to balance the power demand when there is no wind. In the first segment of time slice, when there is, the wind, yeah, there is a, a lot of wind. Also, we see one difference that the excess wind uh, generation, there is a lot of wind, which, uh, which is too much for us. So it's, for this specific power demand. So, so we can see that part of the wind generation could be stored in the hydro pump power plant. And uh, this stored energy could be used, in, for example, in some peak periods uh, later on. So if we introduce a wind power probability curve, we think that the model results much better represent the situation of high wind shares in the future. Another research question which we addressed was, uh, how many approximation steps do we really need? Because as I said, it must, it can be selected by the user. So what is the recommended number of such a, uh, approximation steps of this wind curve in each time slice? And uh, for that, we did uh, the calculations with uh, different pairing type of approximation steps. First, we started from the approach with average, average capacity factors. Then we approximated the improbable curves by two steps, three steps, four steps, five steps. And this, uh, this uh, figure illustrates the results. It should be interpreted like that. If we go from average and capacity factor representation to two step approximation, we can see that, for example, wind capacity decreases by 22% in this case, and fossil capacity increases by more than 50%. If we go from two step approximation of wind power probability curve to three step approximation, we can see that. Wind capacity increases by 24%, and we don't see much difference in, in, in fossil power capacities. 
if we go to more complicated models with four steps or five step approximation, we already see that there is no variations in the results in the model results. So from this, we can conclude that usually three step approximation of this curve is enough to get the results and there is no need to go to the more detailed and more complicated model. So now conclusions that uh, our method, which we have presented, is applicable and effective for long time generation expansion model in order to relate the future power systems with high shares of wind or other renewable power. And uh, by applying this approach, the short term wind power variability is taken into account. And it allows to correctly address balancing capacities and costs needed to cover the periods with low or, or even zero periods when there is no wind or sun available to, to cover the power demand. And finally, the three step approximation is recommended to, to balance between the size of the model and the, the correctness of the results. So thank you for the attention. If you have some questions. Thanks a lot, Dr. Noverda. Thanks a lot for the time, uh, exactly on time. Uh, uh, is there any question? No, not, not in the chat. Uh, um just a question so you 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 say on the last slide that uh, the model uh, could deliver some information about the cost of the system uh, it's one of my question because on one slide uh, you show that for supplying the same level of demand uh, you have a very different uh, structure of the poor mix so uh, yeah when you see uh, the the uh, on the right side uh, uh, I can guess that the global cost of the system could be much higher. Yes, because uh, there is additional investments made by a model for fossil generation. Yeah. And this, yeah. of course, increases the total cost of the system. But if we want to, how to say, avoid situation when there is no power available, when wind is not blowing, so we have to invest in the flexibility of the system to mm -hmm. have a real, 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 reliable power supply mm -hmm. periods when there is no wind. So this way we include these costs into the modeling. And another question, do you have some assumption about the market design that could deliver such a poor mix? <laughs> Uh, maybe it could be how to say the policy thing, how the policies for, for example, the strategies of the energy for country, how it is designed. Mm -hmm. If we see what to, that we need additional capacities to ensure the flexibility of the system and ensure the stability. Maybe we have to, how to say, the, the country needs to do some investment and needs to allocate some funds to, to go to this decision. Yeah. I think this is the policy thing. Yeah. How, it could be designed in different ways, but I can't tell exactly. No, <laughs> it depends on each in the station or in each country. It would be different. For example, yeah. if we take a Lithuanian example, we have very good interconnections with neighboring countries, very good trans transmission capacity. So in, yeah. in our case, it could be not built in locally power generation, we can rely on import even, but. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question? Can I please ask a question? 
of course. Um, in your uh, th thank you very much for the presentation. I think I thought it was interesting to show uh, how finer resolutions can affect your modeling modeling analysis. Um, but my question is, for your ca uh, capacity duration curve um, comparison, yes. um, for the first slice, your red line uh, showed a slightly high, higher than 40% capacity factor. Um, whereas, Wait, yes, this one? no, the, the following one. Yes, the, uh, this one. Um, it shows, so, so the red line shows higher than 40% for the first time slice. Yes. Um, so you took the average capacity factor in that time slice only? Um, in, in, the first in this hours. case, in this case, uh, as I show how the time is divided into time slices, I, we have resulted in 32 time slices. And this curve represents the average capacity in, capacity factor in, in each of these 32 time slices. So for example, if in certain time slice, we have a lot of Wind from statistics, so this resulted in more than 40% of capacity factor in this particular time slice. And this is uh, arranged in the curve of, of the duration curve. So, so this is the average in each time slice. Yes. That's it. Okay. Is it your question? Yes, it, it was my question. Uh, thank you. Is it clear now? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Any any other question? So thanks a lot, Dr. Novazia. And now, Ziming, uh, the floor is yours, and you have twenty minutes for the presentation and five minutes for the question before we end the session. Okay, now I share my screen. Yeah, of course. Can you guys see it? Yeah, we have it. Okay, perfect. So, hi everyone. My name is Xiaoming Khan, and I'm a PhD student from Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. So, today I'm going to present um, some results on an ongoing project, which is called Call the Future with Solar PV. This is a collaboration study conducted by me, two other researchers in Chalmers, and three colleagues in Germany. So, first, let me introduce to you why we are interested in cooling. So uh, according to an IA report in 2019 called uh, the future of cooling, the global electrical cooling demand will be three times as much as the current value in 2050, which is a value higher than 6,000 terawatt an hour. And uh, in terms of the global distribution of the increased cooling demand, it may happens in developing countries in the tropical and subtropical regions. For instance, for the case of India, the cooling demand will increase by 15 times. And for the case of Brazil, cooling demand will increase by more than five times. For China, the cooling demand will be more than doubled. And as a result, cooling demand will account for two, two, 28 percentage of the total demand in India, 22 in Brazil, and 9 percentage in China. So from this, we understand that cooling demand will be a large share of the future electricity demand, especially in developing countries in the tropical area. And uh, now let's look at uh, the share of cooling demand in the hourly peak load. From this figure, we can see that for some countries, such as India and Indonesia, the share of cooling demand in the peak load is higher than 40 percentage. And the value is higher than 30 percentage for US, Middle East, and Brazil. Therefore, from these two figures, we understand utilizing electrical cooling will have a large influence on the total annual electricity consumption as well as the hourly demand profile. And this may have a large influence on the future investment in the electricity system. 
And if we look at this map, we can find that the requirement for cooling goes hand in hand with solar with good solar radiation for all the for all the regions that needs electrical cooling. They also have good solar radiation. In addition, we 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 realize that in the past decade there is a large decrease in cost for solar PV. Therefore, given the apparent synergy between cooling and good solar radiation and the reducing cost for solar PV, it is interesting to understand whether or not utilizing electrical cooling favors the investment in solar PV. And that is the main motivation of our study. And our research question is, how does electrical cooling affect the cost-effective investment in solar PV for the future decarbonized electricity system? Since uh, we investigate several regions in the world and the different regions have different decarbonization strategies, we also want to understand how would CO2 emission target affect the effect affect the investment in solar PV due to increased cooling demand? And this is our research question. And now I move forward to the method part. So to investigate this question, we use a typical greenfield technical economic cost optimization model for capacity investment and dispatch for the electricity system. And the model is run for nine different CO2 emission limits, ranging from 200 to 10 grams CO2 per kilowatt hour of electricity produced. And uh, for the future year, 2000, 2050, the population and the GDP is calculated based on the SSP2 scenario. And we also create the synthetic electricity demand for 2050 and also the GIS data for wind, solar, hydro, all these values are obtained from an uh, open data, open source um, package called Global Energy GIS. You can find this in GitHub. And uh, we investigated the same regions in total in the tropical and subtropical zones. So far, this is the basic setup of the method. And uh, this is our model. Uh, the model is called REX, which, is, which stands for Renewable Energy Expansion. It is a typical energy system optimization model. The objective function is to minimize the annual electricity system cost. And this is a flow chart of the model. The model has inputs, which is the synthetic electricity demand for 2050, renewable energy potentials, hourly capacity factor for wind and solar, and also different scenario inputs and cost assumptions for future technologies. The model can invest in wind, solar, hydro, coal, natural gas, and also variation management strategies, such as transmission and storage. And all these are the decision variables of the model. And the model output included the optimal electricity system cost, the hourly system operation, and also the energy mix for the future electricity system. So these are the several regions we model in this study. And they're Spain, East Brazil, North of Nigeria, West of Saudi Arabia, South India, South China, and Malaysia. So we cover several regions with typical demand for electrical cooling. For the case of Spain and South China, the cooling demand mainly concentrated in the summertime. But for regions such as East Brazil and Malaysia, the cooling demand is relatively averagely distributed or over the year. So this is our, these are all the regions we modeled. They cover a wider range of cooling demand profiles, potential cooling demand patterns. And uh, all the regions we modeled have comparable sizes. So they are in the same magnitude of size. And uh, these regions cover a wider range of cooling demand. So for the case of Spain, the cooling demand accounts for 3% of the total electricity demand. While for the case of North Nigeria, this year is as high as 23%. 
in this study, we mainly look at uh, the impact of residential cooling demand. This is mainly because according to the projection, uh, the majority of the increase of the future cooling demand is coming from the residential sector. And uh, in our model, uh, we separate uh, each region into several sub-regions. For the case of South China, it is divided into four regions. All these regions are allowed to be connected with transmission grids. This is the case of South China, and this is the case of East Brazil. And uh, now I will show you how to calculate the residential cooling demand. So the residential cooling demand is a function of number of households in each region, the, availab the, the availability, which is a fraction of a households that can afford air conditioning. Saturation or the kilometer maximum saturation, this reflects the temperature in the, each region. And in the small E here, this is the average electricity consumption for each house in one year and the efficiency factor which changes over time. So in general, the residential cooling demand is a function of households, income, and the temperature, and also the technology improvement for air conditioners. And now let's look at the detailed calculation. So first is availability. It reflects the affordability for the, for the population. So how many, how, how many households can afford air conditioners? A is a function of GDP per capita. So this is a function of income. It is the exponential function. And uh, let's look at uh, the climate maximum saturation. So the climate, the climate maximum saturation is a function of cooling degree days. This reflects the how, how, how hot uh, each region is. And the cooling degree days here input, as input for this calculation is summed for one year. So it is the annual cooling degree days. And also the, uh, we calculate the electricity consumption per each household. This is a function of cooling degree days in one year and also the GDP per capita, the income of each household. So this is a calculation for the uh, total electricity demand in each region for one year. As for the hourly cooling demand per file, we use cooling degree hours. So the cooling degree hour, uh, for the cooling degree hour, we assume that the electricity cooling demand in each hour for cooling is proportional to the difference between the uh, ambient temperature and the uh, base temperature. So if, a temp if there is a large difference or the temperature outside is higher, then the cooling demand will be higher. So this is for the this is the calculation for the hourly cooling demand profile. We then sum all the hourly cooling demand profile and scale the value to the annual cooling demand. We get the real um, cooling demand series for each region. So this is how we calculate the cooling demand profile. And as for the results part, we try to compare the energy mix for the system with electric cooling relative to a system, sorry. As for the results part, we try to compare the energy mix for a system without cooling and a system with cooling. So we try to compare the energy mixes between these two cases, a system without cooling, a system with, with cooling. By compare the energy mixes for these two cases, we understand how the cooling demand would affect the investment for each case. And then to to uh, give a to give a to give you guys a feeling how a future system would like. So this is a demand profile for two, for the two different cases. The blue color represents the electricity electricity demand over one year. For the case there is no cooling, but and the orange color represents the case there is electrical cooling for the residential sector. So the difference between these two demand profile is the actual electricity cooling demand for the residential sector. And then we can see for the case of South China, the cooling demand mainly concentrated in the summertime. Now let's look at some results. So uh, we want to understand 
uh, our main method is to compare the energy mix for two different cases, the case with cooling and the case without cooling. So here, this figure shows the share of solar in the energy mix. The, the, the column here represented the electricity production from solar PV normalized to the total demand. So this is energy share for solar PV. And uh, the blue color represents the case with cooling and the light blue color represents the case without cooling. First, let's look at uh, a, small chunk, a small chart. We can see that in a small chart, uh, there are several different levels of CO2 emission targets, ranging from 200 to 10. We can see that for different uh, CO2 emission targets, the share of solar PV is always higher for the case with cooling as compared to the case without cooling. From this, we understand that For an electricity system, if we utilize electrical cooling, it will benefit the investment in solar PV regardless of the CO2 emission limit. And we also see um, with a more generous CO2 emission target, target, the system has lower solar PV. This is meant because uh, if a system allows to emit more CO2 emission, the system will invest in more cheap is part of fossil fuels. In this case, the system will have the system will have less solar PV. However, even for a system that has a low share of solar PV, utilize electrical cooling still favors the investment in solar PV. And if we look at uh, all the seven regions, we can find that this phenomenon is consistent. So for all the for all the seven regions modeled in this study. If we utilize electrical cooling, it will make the investment in solar PV more cost effective. So this is uh, the main information from this figure. And then we see, the, we see that electrical cooling benefits the investment in solar PV. Now let's look at what is the effect, on the, what is the effect of electrical cooling on the investment of wind power. And if we look at this figure, we can see that for all the modern regions, if we utilize electrical cooling, the share of wind in the system is lower as compared to a system without cooling. So in this case, uh, we understand utilizing electrical cooling makes the investment in wind power less cost effective. And here we have a very, uh, exceptional case, which is Malaysia, because Malaysia has very bad wind conditions. So the system has little investment in wind power. But we can see from the other six cases, utilizing electrical cooling does not benefit wind. This is opposite compared with the case of for solar PV. And now let's try to understand what is the specific change in the energy mix due to electrical cooling. So here, uh, this figure shows the change in energy mix due to electrical cooling. So basically, we change the we can we calculate the difference in energy mix for the case with cooling and the, the case without cooling. The yellow color represents the share of solar PV in the additional supply mix, and the green for wind and the blue for dispatchable power plants. And we can see that. For different motor regions, um, both wind, solar, and the dispatchable power plants are invested to handle electrical cooling. And uh, the share varies, the share varies due to different CO2 emission targets. However, even for different CO2 emission targets and for different geographical locations, we find that the additional Supply mix is dominated by solar PV, which means solar PV is the main contributor for cooling. And uh, the lowest value is achieved for the case where the CO2 emission target is the largest, which is the value is 58 percentage, still a relatively large number. So this is the, the main information we gain from this figure. Uh, you can, if we increase the electricity demand through electrical cooling, 
the main investment would be in solar PV. And now let's try to understand why utilizing electric cooling favors the investment in solar PV. So we try to uh, find out the correlation between the solar PV output and the cooling demand profile. So the y-axis here represents the hourly solar PV output and the, the x-axis here represents the hourly cooling demand profile. We do this correlation for 2000 hours in the summer period where the, when the cooling demand is highest. So this is a case for Brazil, East Brazil. From this figure, we understand solar PV, the output of solar PV is positively correlated with the cooling demand. And then this, the correlation coefficient for this case is 0 0.8. And, and let's also look at the correlation between wind output and the cooling demand profile. And then for the case of East Brazil, we find that the correlation coefficient is minus 0 0.6 there is a negative correlation here. Let's also look at a case for South of China. We find that for the case of South China, the output of solar PV is positively correlated with cooling demand profile. And the correlation coefficient for this case is also 0 0.8. But for the case wind output and uh, cooling demand correlation, the correlation is uh, negative, but uh, it's a kind of a weak correlation. So from these two figures, we understand that the output of solar PV and the cooling demand profile is positively correlated. So this is why if we utilize electrical cooling for the system, it favors the investment in solar PV, not wind power. And let's try to look at the electricity of the average electricity cost. So this figure shows the change of the average electricity system cost due to electrical cooling. So we try to calculate the average electricity cost difference for the case with cooling and in the case without cooling. We found that for five regions we modeled, if there is electrical cooling in the system, the electricity cost slightly reduces. And uh, for two cases, there is a very minor increase in electricity cost. Overall, if electric, electrical cooling is utilized for the system, the change in electricity cost is very minor. This gave us a signal that utilizing electrical cooling with solar PV does not escalate the electricity cost for the future decarbonized electricity system in the developing world. And uh, here are our conclusions. So first we see that if a system has electrical cooling, or if we utilize electrical cooling, the system will, will have more solar PV. That means utilizing electrical cooling benefits the investment in solar PV. And this effect is consistent regardless of the CO2 emission target. And the second, we found that utilizing electrical cooling has a relatively limited impact on the average electricity cost and uh, therefore we uh, see the potential of solar PV as a suitable solution to affordable cooling for the developing world in the tropical and subtropical area. Thank you very much. This is all my presentation. If you have more questions, you can contact me with my email. Now you can ask me questions if you have any. Thanks a lot, Jiaoming. Um, so um, thank you, very interesting. Uh, um, my question is that um, you have some um, evaluation of the impact on uh, development of PV solar when cooling is needed on the electricity prices. Uh, do you take in account uh, all the question of investment in networks and so on? Um, you just, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, what do you mean by the te investment technologies? You mean the, the technologies that we include in the model or other technologies that we didn't include? In um, the dynamic pressure, I, I do not remember at the beginning uh, because of course uh, we can have an impact on the wholesome market price. Uh, yeah, the more you have PV at uh, zero marginal cost, uh, uh -huh. so price will be, but um, uh, on the global scale of the system, 
uh, do you need some um, investment in the network and so on that could uh, increase uh, the cost of the global system? Oh, yes, yes, definitely. So uh, we, uh, thanks for the question. So very nice remind for me to show some extra results. So basically we have a transmission expansion uh, for this model. So if there is increased of cooling demand, of course there is increase in uh, transmission expansion and also storage to provide a flexibility in the evening. However, uh, even with extra investment in solar PV, uh, transmission and storage, and this does not necessarily uh, increase the average electricity system cost. Of course, the total system cost goes up, but if we use the total system cost to, to divide the total demand, then the cost, the average cost, uh, the change is very minor. So this is our finding in this study. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any other question? Yes, I would have a question. Yeah. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I missed that information, but I was uh, curious if you consider um, uh, evolvement of the availability factor, for example, in the future, you said that you model 2050, right? So yes. I was wondering if you have a different availability um, considered or not. Um, you mean the availability, you mean competitive factor for wind and solar or the potentials of wind and solar? No, first one. Okay, so the, uh, the competitive factor. So for so far, we have just uh, run the model for one with a year, but uh, our plan is to run, let's say, at least uh, five random weather years. So to understand, uh, you know, this interannual change of wind and solar output, how would that affect the modeling results? So this is our plan. But so far, I cannot say too much about that part. Thanks for the <laughs> Okay, report. yeah. Thank you. Oh, and he has a last question. So I think that uh, we can say thank you so much uh, to Juan, Koji, Egitjus, and Xiaoming. It was a very rich and interesting session. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, you have enjoyed uh, this session. And I hope that you will enjoy all the other session plenary as well as concurrent session because Frankly speaking, the program of the international conference is very rich and very interesting. I think it will be a good, we will spend a lot of good moments with all the presentation and the panelists. So thanks a lot. See you, you very much. Okay. I hope in another great conference, international conference, uh, in which I hope that we will be able to meet physically speaking. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks to Bye -bye. everyone. I just want to add in the end, uh, thank you for your uh, presentations. Thank you uh, for the speakers and the attendees. I just want to remind you for the uh, upload uh, the, of the, the presentations to the dashboard. That would be uh, very important for us. So if it hasn't been done, please do it as soon as possible. So thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great conference.